Hi, my name is Joe Jackson. I'm a journalist, author, interviewer, and broadcaster who's interviewed roughly 1,400 celebrities over a 30-year period from most major media outlets in Ireland. What you're about to hear is the second of three podcasts based on an interview I did with Paulie Yates in 1993, and which I titled for the first podcast, Paulie Yates 1993 on Sex, Aging, and Life. Paula, Soul Searching, and Uncensored. In this podcast, the three subjects may change to whatever degree, but Paula, with her characteristically life-affirming sense of humour, continues to soul-search in a way that, frankly, I never heard her do in any other interview. And this, I say, I hasten to add, in praise of her honesty, not my skills or otherwise as an interviewer. In fact, when you sit with someone like Paula, all you really have to do is listen attentively. By the way, if you want to read the article I wrote out of this chat, check out my website, joejacksoninterviewer.com. Also, for those people who may not have heard the first podcast, I'm going to include two or three minutes from the end of the previous podcast, simply because they helped set up what Paula and I then went on to talk about. And at this point in the interview, we were talking about aging. But do you really believe that about yourself? Are you buying that kind of over 30, coming up to 40, whatever, I really start to become? Well, I've had three children. Of course, there's bits of me that fall apart. But need it necessarily follow that that then it becomes unattractive, that you then become physically, sexually unattractive? No, I think that the, what the case is that women expect themselves to be perfect. It's entirely internalised with women. I don't think, or I, I don't believe all this stuff about women dressing for men right. or okay. anything. I think women, it, entirely for themselves. So everything, you know, everything, everything's in your head, isn't it? It's like one day you wake up, you're a goddess. The next day you look exactly the fucking same and you're the biggest ankle snapper that ever walked on God's earth. It's entirely internalised and it's entirely dependent on weird things in your head. So no, I don't really believe that, but I think it's harder for women getting older because that just is. So how are you going to feel then in five years? I mean, do you feel this is going to, your faith and confidence is going to... If you well, think, I think if you it's think... pretty cool, actually, because I seem to be right. getting better as well, but I'm obviously in tune with the masculine in my character. Is that what it is? OK, that's my reading of it, and I'm sticking with that, says she. I'm not very worried myself. Are you I must not? say, no. Maybe I'm very arrogant. Oh, God. Does that sound yeah, really see, arrogant? No, it doesn't, but it is a question, because particularly, uh, like I talked to, it was just coincidence recently, Naomi Campbell with Ari Adam and Ali Nibri Bono. And there is a big question of the male being the male rock star sex symbol and the woman feeling she has to compete yeah. somewhere along the way. No. Then you get to a certain age and you feel, I can't do this anymore, I'm going to really lose, lose him, lose my hold on this marriage. No, because I, I probably, well, in my case, I don't think Bob was ever with me for those reasons. He was with me because I was, because of my... I'm not going to say it, because when it's in black and white, I'm going to look like a cunt. Because of what? He? Because I was um, he said humor, certainly verbally fast on my feet. Right. So certainly the speed of my thought processes has always been more protractive than you know whether I had 24 inch hips. Right. 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 So, so I don't th feel unduly worried from that point of view. Yeah, but when he first saw you, he said, "Great, I'm going to get fucked tonight." You were 17. I'm not surprised. He was in the back of the car with my dick in his mouth. You know, great. That was really astute of him. No, it was in the office that afternoon <laughs> when you walked in the door, right? <laughs> Wasn't it? And you sat on his lap. Yeah. And that was his first thought. So does that make you feel like you might look at a 17-year-old tomorrow and feel the same and I can't compete? No. Really? No, it's I not never a think question. that. I never right. think that. I really don't. All right. But you can see how it could become an issue for... No. For who? That, for, for other people. For a lot of women. They're not well, married to Bob, but, you know, I don't think... But this is actually what that program was about, too, about how women getting to 14. It was Jermaine Greer yeah, It's really beauty. difficult. It's like somebody said Salon. to me... I, I remember when I was, um, when the babies were little and I'd walk down the street and it was really weird because... Hi. Are you Jim? No. 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 Um, sorry, Paula, I'm uh, Mary Richardson from the Reader Town. Oh, to gosh, hi. Um, Jim Benson. What yeah, am I telling you? Everything. What I was going to say was, when I was with the little babies and I remember being invisible to boys, when you were what? When I had the little babies, when they were really little, and I was pregnant with, you know, I had peaches, yeah. but I was pregnant with Pixie, immediate. And I remember walking down the King's Road and thinking, God, it's weird, I'm like I'm invisible. All right. Because it was like you were invisible, just pregnant and a baby and 
and a, and a kid. And so I can see how some people would really, really be bothered. Because there is a point where I think you do get a bit invisible. But that's what you do, that's what you say in the book too, that after having babies, the feminine mystique plummets. You I mean, it's that? a terrible tyranny for women to have to try and live with. I don't know. Maybe I said it. And, you know, maybe they go there, and that's what this was about, uh, going to all these extremes to try and uh, bring back the mystery. Whether it's through facelifts, through kind of endless, uh, you know, beauty salon work, the whole thing. Yeah, and? This is part of what, uh, obviously, it's not something that tyrannizes you. Mm. Right, okay. But I know it does. I know it, it's... It's just like, but it tyrann women are tyrannised over everything all the time. They're tyrannised as teenagers because they're not the same shape as Kate Moss. They're tyrannised when they get to their 20s because they're worried about where their careers are going. They're tyrannised in their 30s because they're worried whether they've got a baby or not, but they don't want to admit it. And then they're tyrannised when they get to mid-30s. They think, fuck me, is my husband still going to like me or is he going to run off with a topless go-go dancer, dancer because, I, you know, I am 35 and I look like 35. So I just think it's this continuous thing that women eventually, maybe in another two generations, will get out of. Is there any sign that they're getting out of that? I don't know, because you know? I said in two generations, because I was thinking of my own children, and I was thinking of Fifi, who is only 11, and already says things that are so girl, kind of girl magazine things, where right. I think, well, where did that come from? Right, right. Because I certainly didn't instill that, and, and women of my generation, I think, were particularly careful not, not to. to instill it in their children. And then suddenly it comes at you, and you think, whoa, you're saying this stuff to me that sounds like you've just been reading Cosmo. I know. You know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know where it comes from, and I hope that maybe another gap and maybe we'll have got out of it, because it's so awful, self-destructive Do you think similar pressure is now growing more for men and on men, too? No. No? I mean, I just came back from Nashville interviewing country stars who now are told that video programs will not be showing country stars over 40, because they don't want to alienate the kids. Who what are they going to do with all the blues control. singers? Well, that's the question. But this is this has become that's a factor, ridiculous. and radio. No, no, there is a dictate in American it's radio. It's also American, isn't it? Well, it, absolutely. But do you not think there is that element too, even in rock? I don't think it. I don't think it's the same for men. No. As a, as a good, not at all. No. Not in any areas. No, because even their it, examples, the people that they have as role models, have just carried on and on and on. You have all the blues singers who are now nine thousand years old yeah. and still cool and still wonderful, and you know, even Bowie, who must be seventy. You know, and he's a god. That was only last time It's just not the same for men. What about yourself in television? I mean, is it, does it become an issue in television? No, it where doesn't. Where you feel, well, I, I don't have know. 10, 5, 15... Well, I don't want 10 or 5 or 15, so right, I could okay. give two fucks. I want two more years. Really? Only that? Why only two years? Is it the contract? Well, it's partly the contract. Right. And it's partly that by then I might have saved up enough money to stop. You want to stop? Mm. And do what? Nothing. I want to have the strength of character to opt out. Right. I find that admirable in people. Unfortunately, I've never quite had the strength of character to opt out of Chanel, which has always been a bit of a difficulty. What's Chanel, sorry? And you're tied in with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so... Um, so I think that my retirement fund is going to have to be slightly bigger than if I was planning to suddenly hoe the fields. Right, right. Do you get any kind of flack because... Uh, Bob has part ownership of the company that puts together the breakfast show. Anybody saying you only got it because of that? No, because anyone who watches the breakfast show and they watch me on it realizes I'm just like perfect for it. Right. Do you know what I mean? Just perfect. But surprising. Within the ethos of the big breakfast. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, but it surprises me because I think you you seem to enjoy it very much, and certainly I people who talk to you seem to love, I love doing it. it. Right. So, but the contract thing and just an eventual hope to get out within two years still stands. Yeah. Right. I don't know, though, because I sure. think that's one of the good things about getting older. I said that to somebody the other day. One of the good things is you, A, suddenly you realise nothing ever quite goes as you plan it. The second thing you realise is nothing is ever black and white. Everything is sort of murky grey and in between, and people are never, you know, you can never be too judgmental. Right. And the third thing is probably just learn some compassion. So I think that's one of the good things about getting older. Well, there's some little fears that we talked about earlier that come in that you have to learn to deal with. Yeah, but you kind of have good things that develop that you don't have when you're younger. Everything's so idealistic when you're young. It's such a strain being idealistic, isn't it? Well, the speed of your brain isn't going to slow now. No. You know what I mean? So, I mean, these are the aspects of a woman, too, as well as a man. That and my bum's not dropped, so we're... <laughs>
doing quite well on two I counties. I can just make that two out of many. I'm feeling quite cheerful, actually, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> was the, you know the thing you talked about, the process of rebirthing, was that just theoretical, or have you... No, I've never done any of those new age things. Have you not? I've never experienced any of those um, things. But my girlfriend, Sue, who is, is a real person Sue who's the in Sue? the book, yeah. Right. We won't be long. No, I just thought you wanted if you wanted to freshen up. No, but I wouldn't mind a cup of tea being sent up before I do the lady from the reader song. Brilliant. The reader song people are here. I know they're here. Okay. Um, yeah, I've you never said done Sue. Sue. Sue is a real. Well, person. just let me clarify to backtrack to put this in at the beginning of the article. The book is not a biography. No. Okay. And nothing but in it is true. But she is true, and I say that she's true. All right. I say right at the beginning, I mean, it's dedicated to her. All right, the point of confusion is the press release, which almost sets out that this is like one of Dirk Bogard's memories. You know the way it yeah, says, well, you've read that. Yeah. But I can see how it might lead. The, yeah. the, the no, public it's not, can't it's read not that real. Anyway. Okay, so Sue is. And but what, Sue but, is. And her She's a true. shining icon of reality in the midst of it all. All right, okay. And Daniel Day-Lewis is. Oh, he's <laughs> very real. <laughs> right. God. Too, too fucking real. Get out of here. Oh, God, you're right. too real <laughs> people. I mentioned him. <laughs> okay, so what about the process? Did you ever find any of that attractive, that she went through it, and would you want to be part of it? No. No? No, no. need? No. I don't find any of that attractive. I find it very attractive in Sue. I find the whole sense of her otherworldliness and the fact she's so in tune with all of the things that I might, in a normal person, regard as slightly nonsensical, enchanting. Like what? Just Nature, the, the rhythms of life, yeah, those, everything. the cosmos. And yeah, in Gaia. You know, I just love it. And I love but is the part way of you also is. cynical about that? Slightly, yes. Yeah. I mean, I used to have a friend who used to wear his cardboard pyramid hat all the time at home. Right. And I used to find it most disconcerting. Right. It wasn't a nice cardboard pyramid hat then, no? But they're never very fetching. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's hard to look good. Even Naomi could not probably look good in a cardboard pyramid hat. Right. So you don't have any kind of deep needs that would lead you in directions like that, exploring the self in those ways? No, no because I don't want myself explored. Even by yourself? No. <laughs> never did? No. Been through analysis? No. No? No. So, what is the writing? I don't it? often talk to people about what I... It's very bizarre, this what is? our conversation. You don't usually talk about the way things anything. like... No? No. This is my first interview where I think I've talked about anything. It's been very interesting. But what is... is right, you see, a lot of people use writing to do that. Self-therapy, they don't want to go through all the kind of I traditional therapies. I did that therapies. with one novel I wrote. Yeah? And then I wouldn't let them publish it. Really? Are you going to ever let them publish it? Probably not. When was this? Um, in 19... Oh, I don't know, about five years ago, I wrote a book called Good Times with Bad Boys. Right. And, um, which was going to be published by Bloomsbury, who, who right. publish all, a lot right. of my other stuff. Right. And um, they gave me all the money and I spent it, but they've luckily not asked for it back, which is very sweet of them. <laughs> it's really nice of them. No, I've wrong them about it. Right, so okay. do you know, and they said, well, this when is, you... That's the part I cut from the interview. Get there, Lewis. Yeah. They put you with a bill. When you, you feel to... like it, you can finish it. But when I finished it, I'd said so many things that were sort of real. It was too raw, too, too revealing. But, but there are those who would say, if I can get that out of the way, well then, whenever anybody else can come up with me, I need never fear. It wasn't you, real you in know the what sense I mean? of it being scandalous. It was All just right. real in the sense of what I truly thought about lots of things. And you don't want that to be known? No. So you create these kind of uh, other books and other worlds within like the new book, which are as far removed. <laughs> as you want to keep well, reading. there's threads of me. Yeah, but there's not, not as much, I didn't get, as, I didn't get a great, as much a sense of you from reading the book as I did from talking with you today. You know what I mean? I got yeah, characters you, got you created. <laughs> I'll say that about the book. <laughs> Don't people go out and buy No, in the book, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of frothy and it's sweet and it's just the English countryside and it's meant to be escapist. It's not, it's not. With another edge to it. Yeah. But the right. edge is the edge is the whole idea of opting out. But I don't think most people will think that. Right. The edge is the idea that you could give it all up and it would still be all right, and you could be out there where nothing happens, and it's still pretty cool. Cool, of oh, course. Cool. 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 Yeah. Right, right. Okay. So then the last question is: I think Clive James once said that you and Bob would one day regret being so honest or explicit about your sex lives. But to take I've it in not a been very sense. honest about my sex life. Well, the way he described the... the well, he, he's been dreadfully honest. Jesus, he could have been a lot less honest, and I frequently remind him of... But he didn't say uh, it was uh, in your mouth, I don't think. I think it was a hand or a blowjob. He didn't say which it was in that car. No, so he, he, did he didn't go all the way. Oh, did he? Yeah. Because I've never lived it down. Even now, when I get in the back of cars with people, they're worried. They're, <laughs> they're worried it's going to be like a Hoover or something. The minute I'm in the back of a you know, Ford Fiesta. 
Well, I'm not and quite no, you know what I mean? I've something. never lived down jokes about that. Oh, do you get that? Is that kind of like the Mars the bar story yes. with uh, you know who? Absolutely. Are you the tea? I'm the tea. You're the tea. I'm okay. the desperate tea. Right. Okay. Um, I've never lived it down. And I didn't know it was in until it was in. Oh, really? Had you not seen the, uh, ro the rough draft? No. Kind of no, because Bob and I never talk about work. We never, ever mention work to each other. Um, and we never had when he was doing Live Aid. I mean, I always use this as an example. Everyone thought I was wildly unsupportive because I didn't know the date of Live Aid until right. ten, day, 10 days before it. All right. Because he never, ever talks about work. Well, but what, do you feel then, so Clive James is right to say that one day you both may live to regret? No, because he doesn't regret it. He thinks it's hilarious. And I don't regret anything he does. But your children read it, you know? I mean, is there, is there that moment? What? Fifi's going to read that? Yeah. And what? She's going to be so horrified? She's she thrilled. She's no, she'll have a hold over you. You can't give out to her if she does the same thing or if she's cutting the same thing. I wouldn't be, I don't think I'm worried about the same, those things All right. with her. I'd be far more worried about different things. You wouldn't be worried about her being in the same position? Well, well I would now because we're would talking you about... And it, would I be worried yeah. if she was 17 yeah. years old and she and was with a rock star? Yeah, to a block, of, yeah. I would be worried about it because of the present climate where I would be very worried about anything to do with sex for young people simply because of AIDS. Right, but not on, not on a moral question, because then it gets into the territory of we thought we'd never say these things to our kids. You know, like some no, of the people who are not smoking would, dope and no, say you can't do that. No, I wouldn't be particularly worried on it uh, uh, from the moral point of view. I'd be extremely, although the two are entirely entwined at this point, simply sure, because sure of AIDS. Yeah, so yeah. one's morals and one's fears for safety are entirely, the whole morality has to change and has changed for people. When right. I was a teenager, you could sleep with anyone you wanted quite happily if you chose to. I don't think any teenager on earth could possibly do that now if they have an ounce of sense because it simply is not safe. You can have good times with bad boys. You could if you chose to. Yeah. At least you had choice. Yeah, yeah. So if you write an absolute autobiography... I would never you do You would it. never do that? Never, ever. And it certainly would never be as explicit. I mean, even emotionally. Oh God, no, that would be the least of my... Emotionally, it would be entirely constipated. It would have absolutely no revelation whatsoever. But why? Because you can't face that or don't want to? I don't want anyone to... I don't need because anyone Because Bob really to tore, need. took his demons and he laid them out flat on the table. Yeah, but table that was because be. he wrote... It was a truly great book he wrote. But that was part of its power, that was part of its energy, that he had to face those ghosts and yeah, horrors totally from childhood. Yeah, totally cathartic and it's yeah. totally brilliant and it's the best book I've read. Right. It's a fantastic book. My, I was very far back in the fucking queue when Pathos was handed out. And I think there are some things in my life that would deserve some degree of the, the grief of them could uh, sh should be given some voice to, and I would not be able to do that. I am actually right. incapable of doing it. Of wanting to evoke that feeling. No, of pathos. being able to tell, tell it as it was instead right. of making it seem like it was funny. Well, isn't that a way of dealing with it? It doesn't work. There are Does some not? things in your life I just truly don't believe it works to be funny about them. Right. Okay. Can we have to... Seeing you're Mr. Fascinating, I figure the telethon can wait. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now that I'm so gripped by it. Right. It's been like being in therapy, and I'll probably go upstairs now and just ring Bob and talk about 14 hours. Fascinating hot press was. <laughs> well, he, well, I know Bob from a long time ago. Oh, do you? We're both from Dunleary, so... Well, he's just completely kind of fantastic, the same, isn't he? The same. He's just the most I don't know him thing. as well as you do. He's a wonderful you know. thing. We were on the Dole together, which was really sweet. When he had his long hair. That and was back in, what, 76, 76? Yeah, just, just before anything just before broke. anything. And uh, I did see him tearing strips off a person in a shop one day, and I thought it was sexist behaviour. Sexist? Yeah, I just thought oh, it was. Oh, Bob's probably very sexist. Yeah, just snapping the fingers at, it, at someone because the present he was buying, she wasn't getting it fast enough, and I felt, hey, that was after he got... Oh, I'm sure Bob's know, very so. sexist. So anyway, to go back to the book you'll never write. That Why is, the, is, that is the book you so never much? do. Because, I, because I've met, I, I love interviewing uh, creative people. I've interviewed so many poets and playwrights writers who, who would see the only way I'll ever come to terms with all that and to help with the response after that is if I do it. I mean, the worst case, and I don't like the guy, is Bob Monkhouse right now. But isn't that a brutally honest book? Didn't yes, you admire that's what, that's what him? I, was great about I just admired that book when I read it. He was on the bed, so I had to read his book, and I remember reading it and thinking whatever one thought of Bob Monkhouse, anyone who could say those things, all the things that you know yeah. you know about yourself, know. but you just don't let on because you just don't need to say them to people. And he said them all yeah, in his I book. I know, the letter to his father. Oh, I just couldn't believe that, you know, when I read it. 
But it seems to have been astounding therapy for him, even that letter. I don't know if he was on television here talking about how he didn't know how to deal with his feelings for his father. And, and either his wife or somebody said, why don't you just write yeah, him a letter? Yeah. And it just turned into hours of weeping and writing and writing and writing. I mean, it all strikes me that, you see, but if you say emotionally constipated, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem for you. No, I don't think You know does. what I mean? And that's the difference. It's only if it kind of is something that's really blocking you in other ways that you'd feel, or I might suggest, maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing to try and do. I remember him being right. sent to the psychiatrist when I was 12, and I, I sat there, and I remember him asking my, his first question, which is something terribly innocuous, saying, I won't tell you. That was it. And that was the end of it. Right. That was it. I think it was right. three sessions of, why would I tell you? Right. And I was 11. But there's not a clenched fist inside you waiting like Monk has to kind of just burst out when you finally face feelings about family, father, mother, self? No, because I think that the things that I feel about family, father and mother are um, entirely what make the good things in me. Right. It still hurts? Yeah, it does, and I really feel angry. I really am a pissed off girl. But on the other hand, I'm really good with my kids, and I think largely because of, of all that. Has that been part of the anger that's fired you? Yeah. Going back to 12, 14? No, much before that. Much younger Back into than childhood? That. Much before that. But don't you ever want that? Is, I better wrap it up. I mean, I'll send you a bill on this one. This yeah. is like therapy. <laughs> Don't you ever want to be released from that? I mean, the best question I asked uh, somebody was, it was Leonard Cohen. He wrote a song about, uh, I asked my father something about, next time you send me back into life, send me with a spirit that is calm. And I asked him, would he, would he want that if it meant sacrificing all the poetry? Because it's obviously written out of seeking a spirit that is calm. So, I mean, the question is, would you want to be released from that fire? That energy that's kind of obviously pushed and pushing you right through. No, I think a bit of angst never hurt anyone. But it's not just angst, no, it's angst and rage and the determination. I mean, it's a nice little network. It's a good owner as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. I've got Gay Burn this evening. He hates me. Does he? I don't like Gay anyway. Do you stand? Hi, Joe Jackson here again. I thank you for listening to this edition of the Joe Jackson Interviews podcast. And don't forget, if you want to read the article I wrote based on this 90-minute conversation with Paulie Yates, check out my website, joejacksoninterviewer.com.